all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so today i have with me dr turab sayed he is a consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon in britain welcome dr turab sayed and happy new year happy new year to you and thank you for inviting me so we'll be talking about knee arthritis today with you so before that can you please tell us a little bit about yourself i am a consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon and before that i had experience of working with elite uh, sports player like english uh, football team c in england 11 and i've also been doctor for the english cross country athletics for 2 years and i've done masters in uh, sports medicine and i'm also fellowship trained in foot and ankle surgery and hip and knee replacement excellent thank you very much so uh, i wanted to make this clear to the um, to the audience here this is not a sponsored um, video there is no commercial interest here um, dr turab sayed is a is a surgeon and i wanted to have some surgery lectures as well especially knee surgery and knee related problems so this is his uh, website this is turabsayed.co.uk the links are all present in the description of this video as well and here you can find ways to reach out to dr turab sayed if you need to so with this um so we are going to talk about knee arthritis today uh, please tell us what is knee arthritis uh, knee arthritis is a condition where either as a result of osteoarthritis for which heavy weight or as a result of trauma getting injury to the cartilage or the meniscus of the knee or as a result of inflammatory process like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis one develop degeneration of the knee where the cartilage which can be described as a smooth marble which becomes rough irregular friction increases and as the cartilage starts wearing out the fluid in the joint starts seeping into the bone which starts causing pain the cartilage itself does not have any blood supply it does not have any nerves so damage of the cartilage itself is pain free but the pain comes from the inflammation as a result of synovitis or as the fluid seeping into the deeper layers into the bone where there are nerve fibers understood and so this does this diagram help at all to explain this part is this the normal yes this yes. is the normal where your arrow is and the other one is the abdominal the abdominal cartilage and what i tell my patients my patients most of the time is that you have a brand new car brand new car the brand new tire this is your normal not natural part and then the car tires have got tires they have worn out and now the car needs replacing and then when tire needs replacing we replace it by doing a total knee replacement and in between the new car tire and the total knee replacement there are modalities of treating like doing physiotherapy having injections which are various forms and then surgery as a last resort where we replace the cartilage with the metal plates and in between we put a plastic plate to reduce the friction understood so what age does this start can anyone from young age to old age can develop arthritis and what are the signs and symptoms of it mm -hmm. the age is very important because those people who suffer from inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis they can develop in early years they can even develop in their 20s and 30s this used to be very common say 20 years ago when there were no biologics biologics are like monoclonal antibodies which i do not have any experience of but the rheumatologists give it to inflammatory arthritis patient and it slows down the wear out of the cartilage and nowadays it's rare to see people in the 20s and 30s to require knee replacement but they may require injections if some process has already started and other side are the people who are osteoarthritic who have been running jogging and having lots of wear and tear of their knee and they are in their 60s and 70s and in the middle you find really active sports people who are professional athletes or high level weekend warriors and they end up having either a twisting injury to the knee which can lead to 
uh, either a meniscal injury or they've got the ACL whereby the knee starts moving front and back and they did not get their ACL repaired, which makes the knee unstable and leads to increased wear and tear. So I have a question because I'm now uh, above 50 as well. Is this inevitable or so we're going to talk about the treatment of it, but is it, are there any things to do that can prevent or slow down the degeneration or deterioration? I think that's a very good question. And that's like the holy grail. If we knew the answer, then I'll be out of job, not doing a knee replacement. An implant company would have gone out of business. But there, there, there is an element, there is an, a weak evidence. When somebody asks me, I, I tell them, look, there's a weak evidence which came from people who suffered from rheumatoid arthritis that people should take glucosamine sulfate. The most important uh, thing in that study was that that component glucosamine should have sulfate in it. It comes in potassium, it comes in KCL, sodium, but glucosamine sulfate. And I'd say take glucosamine sulfate for three months, keep a pain diary. And if you think you're feeling better, keep on taking it. Otherwise you're spending a lot of money because it's not available on prescription. You have to buy it over the counter yourself. Understood. Thank you very much for this one. So now let's go to the uh, the management of it. So when should a patient be managed? And what are the management procedures? Do we ask for physiotherapy first? Or do we right away go for uh, injections or supplements? What happens? I, I, I think it depends at what stage you capture the patient. There are some people who would come to you earlier on when they have the slight swelling of the knee, slight pain. Normally the arthritis pain is ache, which gets worse when the weather is cold, improves when the weather is warm, gets worse by the activity, gets worse towards the end of the day if it's osteoarthritis and stiffness, which is worse in the morning if it's inflammatory arthritis. So it depends when you see the patient. Some patients you would see earlier on where you would say, let's start with physio, let's have injections, build up your muscles, and that can improve with pain. Some people come to you so late that they're already bone on bone. And you can have a trial of physiotherapy, but I say realistically have a trial of physiotherapy, but I think it may not work. But at least when you have physiotherapy, then both I and the patient know in our mind that we have tried all the other things. And the only option left is surgery, which is the last resort. I do not take surgery lightly. I say I should only do it because there are risks and complications. When you're clear in your mind, that everything else has failed. Understood. Thank you very much. So I have a question that, that has been asked of me many times, and I do not have a good answer for this. So many times when, when there is, let's say, degenerative changes in the uh, spinal cord discs or knee joint or hip joint, uh, there is physiotherapy prescribed. And patients sometimes say that wouldn't further usage cause more damage. So what is the answer to that? Um, I say that we should not wrap you up in cotton wool. You should live the life the way you want to do. If you want to do hiking, go hiking. If you want to do play tennis, play tennis. And when you're unable to do those activities, that's when the time to intervene, either medically by injections, by taking regular painkillers, they improve your pain. You don't have to have surgery or the last resort is surgery. So I say go and do whatever you want to do. Yes, it may wear out the cartilage more, but this is like if you've got a nice car, the tires are worn out. You won't say, oh, I'm not going to drive my car. I'm going to start going everywhere by walking. Yes, you use your car. When the tires go to legal limit, tread is gone. Then you go and get a new tire. Makes sense. Thank you very much. So then how do we treat it? Physiotherapy is one. Do yeah, we do? Yes. Yeah. So physiotherapy, I think I I always refer people for physiotherapy, even if I'm going to operate on them. I say go and have physiotherapy, which I mean prehab, which is similar to like when people have ACL injuries, you build up their muscles before surgery because when you do surgery, you cut through the muscles, the muscle would waste away. So if you build the muscle up and then it wastes away to normal, that's fine. But if you start here where the muscle is already wasted, you do surgery and it goes further down then patient finds it difficult to mobilize after surgery. So the simple exercise is if this is the knee, you need to keep the knee straight. And if this is the hip, move it all the way up so that the anterior quads muscle, they become really bulky and you build it up. 
other simple analgesics are like anti-inflammatories. Some people can't take anti-inflammatories if they're asthmatic or if they've got stomach ulcers. The other option is to take cocodamol, which is opioid or codeine-based preparation. These days, they are people are not very keen because they've got a slight potential of addiction. So I say, look, if your pain is reasonably controlled with two tablets a day, you should take that rather than have a big major surgery. Uh, or if you don't want to take tablets, some people don't, then we have various kind of injections available. So um, talking about the injections, what kind of injections and um, how do you administer them frequency when and what is the outcome? Right. I think that's a subject on its own. I could do a PhD on it. So injections can be very simple, like uh, cheap and cheerful corticosteroid injection, which has got its own risks and complications. And I normally avoid doing a corticosteroid injection. If somebody is pretty bad, they need surgery in six months because that increases the risk of infection in the implant we're going to put. The other injections are viscous supplementation which are several different brands are available like Synvisc, Synvisc 1 over here is like a Duralan or Haligan injections, which are all visco supplementation, which is artificial joint fluid in simple terms, which is manufactured by putting a human gene into the bacteria, which creates this artificial joint fluid and we inject it. And the key is that it would try to recreate the space in between the joint of the bone is touching the bone, recreate the space. They won't touch each other and they won't hurt. Then another kind of injection is called as platelet-rich plasma injection or fat stem cells or lipogens, whereby in platelet-rich plasma, one takes blood from the anticubital fossa, spins it around, concentrates the platelet, inject it into the knee in early arthritis, not on bone and bone. And in stem cells, I work with a plastic surgeon who takes the fat cells, harvests them from tummy or from the legs and put them in a special thing, agitate them, activate the parasites, and then inject them into the knee. But some people think lipogem is experimental treatment. I'm not sure whether it's available in the States or not, but it's certainly available in UK. And finally, for last three, four years, we had a new product which is not licensed yet in uh, United States, but available in all over Europe with the CE marking is called as hydrogel. I'm not saying the trade name. If you want me to, I can say the trade name, but it's a hydrogel, which is much thicker, high molecular weight product, which stays in the joint and doesn't go away like steroid injection or visco supplementation. Excellent. Thank you very much. So because this lecture can be put in the CME courses, uh, usually it, if we are going to speak a trade name, then there has to be three or we don't, we talk in generics. If you would like to still talk about a trade name, then we will not put this in the CME. We'll just talk trade name. Up to you. I know, but I said uh, the trouble is, uh, I said with the hydrogel, I think the patent is with one company, like Visco Supplementation. I gave you three names. Because the patent is with one company, I think unless it's 10, 15 years when the patent runs out, <laughs> then there will be other manufacturers doing it. So th in that case, one name is sufficient, I think. Right. Okay. So the name is Arthro Summit. And the most important thing is that it's such a viscous material, you have to, they only come in one mil syringes and you have to give six syringes into a patient under ultrasound guidance or we orthopedic surgeons are normally quite happy to know where the joint is because we open it and operate it so we can do it blindly, but radiologists normally inject under uh, ultrasound guidance and six syringes, one mil each because it's such a viscous thing that if you put it in a five or six mil syringe, you won't be able to inject it into the patient. Interesting. So tell me this. We haven't talked about corticosteroids yet, but tell mm -hmm. me this. These injections, how long do they help? Um, this one, as I said, it's been around for four or five years. So it, I'll tell you a little bit about it. This came from veterinary medicine. In Denmark, they were giving it to people when the horses were becoming lame. They were elite racing horses. They gave it to them and the horses didn't become lame. And then they said, okay, the rheumatologist started using in humans. And then they found it, okay, it's working in humans. This stage, they produced data for three years. Younger the patient. 
And less the arthritis, up to three years, they have got good data. Up to 80% people get pain relief. And four years data would be coming soon. You mentioned that we did not mention corticosteroid injection. Uh, I did say, I think steroid injection, but probably I may not have said corticosteroid. I, I may have missed it. I may have missed it. So tell me this. How does the steroid injection uh, match up to the other, like hydrogels, etc.? Do they have a combined efficacy or do they need to be given separately or this is a different stage of the disease? Yeah, this is an entirely, uh, hydrogel is entirely different product. So corticosteroid injection work by going in over there and reducing the inflammation. Corticosteroid injections have got a law of diminishing returns, which I tell my patient that this time I'm giving an injection. Say your pain score is 10, it would reduce it down to one, two or zero. And it may give you a relief for two months to two years, first time. Second time round when I would give it to you, so the pain score may not drop from 10 to zero, it may drop from 10 to two. And the duration may be, if first time it was two years, the duration may be 18 months. Third time I'll give you, the duration would keep on going down. So a lot of diminishing returns, less effect, less duration. And generally speaking, you can inject somebody with a corticosteroid injection, three. And if you really twist my arm, patient doesn't want to have surgery, I might give it to you four times a year, but not more frequently than that. Understood. So before we go to a more extreme case where these things are not working. I want to have some questions as well. So the audience here, if you have a question, please put some letters like Q in front of them. But I can see one question over here. Uh, John says, is it true in the long run that corticosteroids can actually make the joints worse? Uh, that, that's a very good question because nobody knows whether the joint has got worse because we have given them corticosteroid or whether the joint has got worse because that's a normal progressive disease process. But what we know for sure is that if we go and operate on somebody with a corticosteroid injection, do a total knee replacement, three months within of the date of steroid injection, then there is a higher risk that there would be infection around that new artificial prosthetic joint that we have put in. So if you keep on having steroid injections, then yes, people say, because when we go, somebody who had a loads of steroid injection, we see lots of calcium being deposited inside the joint. And uh, we call it chondrocalcinosis. And I tend to prefer giving a corticosteroid injection, which has got the least amount of calcium in it for that reason, because I see them when I do the total knee replacement, while my uh, rheumatology colleagues, they still like to use a different kind of steroid, which has got a higher chalk consistency in it. Understood. One more question before we move on. Uh, Abdi Fitha Abdullahi says, is there some foods that increase, I believe they must be talking about the joint fluids, um, any foods that can help with this? Supplements? Uh, yes, food, there are some foods like blueberries and there are lots of other fluids. And one of my colleague, he is an expert in that. He always tells his patient, go and eat this, change your diet like this because it would help you and he, presses them on doing exercise. Uh, I would uh, plead my slight ignorance because I do not profess this. I tell them about the uh, glucosamine sulfate. Uh, and the only thing which I would say is those people who got glucosamine sulfate, they must make sure that they're not allergic to shellfish because it's normally taken from shellfish. So if they're allergic to shellfish, they should not take it. And generally good exercise because the joint cartilage is avascular, aneural, it gets its nutrition by movement of the joint. The more you move the joint, that would give it its nutrition to the cartilage. So I would say that you should do the exercises which move your joint. And another thing which people feel is, though I'll have my surgery and my knee would bend more. No, knee would never bend more. Knee would only bend as much as it could bend before surgery or slightly less because body would make scar tissue. So it's important to keep using your knee rather than saying, oh, my knee is hurting. I'm not going to use it. Understood. There are actually now more questions. So I'm going to ask you some more questions. I want to go to the knee replacement surgery as well. So let's start with some more questions. Roller Girl says, so calcium builds up when the steroids shot goes? Yes, because calcium, if, if you look at most steroid injections, they would look white or milky white in color because they have got calcium added into it to stabilize the product. 
So calcium need to be added. And when you're injecting, you're injecting it into your body. So it's not calcium coming from somewhere else in the body. It's the calcium which is being injected with the steroid injection. And the more injections you have in a fixed amount of space, be it a joint in a knee or a hip or a foot, the more calcium would deposit there because it cannot get absorbed by body from the joint. Understood. Uh, Kathleen says, if someone has ortho, uh, osteoarthritis in hips, does it form of arthritis travel throughout the body? Um, I think it would be difficult to say travel throughout the body because the osteoarthritis can affect the hips and the knees. Uh, inflammatory arthritis can affect multiple joints. Sometime, uh, what happens is that somebody is having arthritis in the hip, they're getting pain in the knee. And similarly, sometimes there's arthritis in the knee, but they're getting pain in the hip, which gives us a diagnostic dilemma. And we sometimes try to find out which joint is actually causing the pain by using what we call as a diagnostic injection. We inject the joint. And if that shuts up the pain, then we say, look, the pain in your thigh or pain in the hip, we injected your knee and that hip pain went away is probably coming from your knee arthritis and vice versa. Understood. One more question. Uh, the Sigmir says, do you recommend correcting anything with the foot, like correcting problems there that can cause knee, hip, and spine problems? I think this is a leading question. The answer is yes, because the thing is the body is like a kinetic chain. So the other thing, important thing is that, yes, you need to correct the deformity of the foot because if your foot is uh, everted or inverted, then that would put abnormal load on your knee. I'm just trying to pretend that this is the foot, this is the knee, and then that would load on the hip and then load on the uh, spine. If somebody's leg is shorter, then that would affect the whole chain. The other thing of surgery is that we try to do the central joints. So if somebody's got the arthritis of the hip, arthritis of the knee, arthritis of the foot or ankle, we replace the hip first then we replace their knee and then we replace their ankle because these are irreversible procedures and in the meantime we'll say have some orthotics to correct the alignment understood so one more question i'm going to answer <laughs> this one is sly foxy says dr mean medical lectures is he a relative of yours working in the uk because we both have the same last name <laughs> I, 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 I should have i should have done i was thinking of this earlier on when i looked your know, name on the screen i should have done a disclaimer we're not related to each other i think the only thing is that we both have been in the same medical school but we never met in the medical school i think you had graduated when i was in the med school and are you from king edward i'm from king edward yeah and can I can I tell you a story? I have got another colleague in Scotland who's got the same surname as me, who's an orthopedic consultant. And when we traced our family tree, we go back to same grandfather 1450 years ago. So we had never met anyone. What the chances of two sayers being in the same hospital, same department as orthopedic consultant? So sometimes very interesting. Yeah, sometimes this happens. So me and Mr. Mubin say it is not related. Yeah, well, our family, family names are the same. It's a family. It's a last name. Yeah. So uh, uh, I really love it that you are from King Edward. King Edward graduates are the best graduates in the world. And so here are the two best <laughs> graduates in the oh, world. Uh, All right. I'm, I, I, I'm an average surgeon. I'm an average doctor. I'm not as great <laughs> as, as you are, Dr. Bean. No, I, I'm not great. I'm, I was just, uh, that was just a little levity. Okay, so tell me this. The knee replacement, when should that happen? What are the indications that we need to go from these injections to the replacement? And what is the prognosis? What are the outcomes? Yeah, so I think, I think knee replacement is a very good procedure. 80% of people are happy with it. It gets rid of the pain. The only op operation indication is pain to get rid of your pain permanently. Uh, it does not make your knee any less stiff. It does not make you run any faster. It doesn't make you swim any faster. Um, indication is when you're unable to control it with injections and pain and you want a permanent solution or when the injections have stopped having their effect. And what we do is that we have shown you the picture of the um, arthritis in the knee replacement. I'll undo this so that you can see that we 
go and I've taken knee has become arthritic. We go and shave the bones off like this so that they match the shape of the implant we're going to put in. There are lots of different companies making different implants and this goes on the top of the femur. And then this metal bit goes onto the tibia. There are lots of different, some go, some click, some lock. This is just an example. And then a plastic in between so that they are low coefficient of friction and that's what we do. So recovery from surgery is most people have their operation done these days. We, what we do is called as day case joint replacement. They go home the next day. We help them by giving blocks and other things. And um, most people are able to drive at six weeks. Excellent. And um, does that replace knee? How long does that last? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it depends. The more you use it, the more it wears out. On majority of people, people have up to 95 to 97% survival rate anywhere from 15 years to 25 years. I see on average 15 to 20 years. Then you need to have a second operation done because the, the main restricting factor is this plastic. This plastic wears out. When the plastic wears out, the metal starts rubbing on metal. Then we have to go and do the whole thing because when the plastic wears out, the white cells try to come, they try to chew it. They can't chew it, can't degrade it because there's plastic synthetic material. So those white cells die. When the white cells die, where the bone has been fixed either in the cemented or uncemented form, in America, you're only allowed to do cemented knees. We can do uncemented. It makes it loose at these cement bone implant interface and these implants become loose. So we have to go and uh, reapply and do that. Understood. Thank you very much. So I think that these are the, is there any other management techniques that we uh, did not no, discuss? No, I think that what we didn't discuss, uh, which is slightly disingenuous, is that if you've got only arthritis in half of the knee, then there is a, a treatment called as unicompartmental knee or a half knee replacement, where we only replace inside or outside of the patellofemoral joint. But majority of people, they wait, and especially on the NHS, they wait for us to come and the arthritis in all the compartments and majority of people over the age of 60, they have total knee. Younger patients can have uni knee or older patients can have uni knee if the arthritis is in only one compartment. Although I am trained to do uni knees, but I don't do them because of the low volume and I refer them both privately and on the NHS to my other colleague. And I've got no hesitation, no shame. If patient is right for a uni knee, I say, look, you'd best served with a quicker recovery to go and see my colleague who can do a half knee because then it's a half of trauma to the knee and half recovery time. Understood. Thank you so much. So we are about half an hour. I'm going to yes. just ask you a couple of more questions and then we, we will uh, up. wrap up. So uh, Rubina says, what is the place of hyaluronic acid joint injection and PRP joint injection? Yeah. I think you missed it. I said about hyaluronic acid. We just visco we call them visco supplementation because hyaluronic acid um, can have lots of different molecular weights. Some are high molecular weights, some are middle, some are low molecular weights. So we say visco supplementation. And platelet rich plasma injection, I said, has got place in early arthritis, not in grade four bone on bone. Understood. Thank you. And one last question. John says, does Dr. Sayed use red light therapy on patients for inflammation? I do not because I am trained as a surgeon, so I am biased. But if you'd go to physiotherapist, I'm sure they would do that. That's why I do not interfere in these things. I refer a patient for physio, and a physio thinks it's appropriate. Sometimes they use ultrasound. Sometimes they use other therapies as well. Got it. So thank you very much for this one. I think we'll take up the plantar fasciitis and the uh, Achilles tendonitis, etc in the next the hip joint is also a very interesting topic that is very prevalent uh, issue as well so thank I'll you very much for joining us find a model for hip joint so i'll try to find one in my hospital excellent thank you very much thank you for the insights and thank you for helping and thank you for the talk yeah, thank you for thank you for the invite it's my pleasure have a lovely day happy new to you all thank you bye-bye 
So cool beans, thank you very much. With this, we would stop today. I'm going to come online in another few minutes and I want to discuss with you the plan for this year and then um, we'll take off. So stay tuned. I'm going to come back online in a few minutes.